It's absolutely perfect. Now, I wonder, I wonder if these fish look at each other's shells and say, don't you think she's kind of fat? <laughs> Oh my, those markings aren't really very well spaced. Because <laughs> that's what we do. See, we don't realize that all of us in our various goings-on and behavior and so on are just as mar more marvelous, much more complicated, much more interesting. All these gorgeous faces that I'm looking at. You know, every one of them, some are supposedly pretty, some are supposedly not so pretty, but they're all absolutely gorgeous. And everybody's eyes is a piece of jewelry beyond compare. Beautiful. But we have specialized in a certain kind of awareness that makes us neglectful of that. You see, we specialize in more or less briefly concentrated pinpoint attention. We look at this and we look at that. And we select from all the things we might possibly be aware of only certain things. And as a result of that, we leave out of our everyday consciousness, generally speaking, two dimensions of experience. One, amazing beauty of experience that we never see at all. And on the other hand, the very deep thing, the sense of our basic identity, unity with, oneness with, the total process of being. See, because we are staring, as it were, at certain features of the landscape, we don't see the background. And because we get fascinated with, you know, I could go into details of this shell, as I said, and put myself in the mind of a conch or whatever it is that lives in this thing, and say, um, hmm, that's not so hot, that one. <laughs> like that, see? And so, I wouldn't see the whole thing. <laughs> but when I look at it like this, when anybody looks at it like that, we say, oh my God, isn't that gorgeous? Another way of talking about the web is that there are different levels of magnification. For example, supposing you take a piece of embroidery and here it is, obviously in front of you, an ordered and beautiful object. And then you take out a microscope and you look at the individual threads. At a certain point, as you turn up the microscope, you'll get a hopeless tangle, which doesn't make any sense at all. The wrapped fiber that constitutes the thread is a mess. It hasn't been organized, nobody did anything about it but at the level of magnification at which you actually see it with the naked eye, it's all been organized. All right, now keep turning up that microscope. Take one of those individual threads in the fiber that seems to be so chaotic and go into the constitution of that. And again, you'll find fantastic order. You'll find the most gorgeous designs of uh, molecules. Then to keep turning it up, and again, at a certain level, you'll find chaos again. All right, keep going. And at another level, you'll find this marvelous order. Now, you see, order and randomness constitute, in other words, the warp and the woof. Where everything is in order, everything's under control. In randomness, it's all, all it's a mess. But we wouldn't know what order was unless we had messes. It's the contrast of order and messes that order itself depends upon. And so in this exactly the same way, it is the contrast of on and off, there and not there. In other words, life and death.
being and non-being that constitutes existence. Only we pretend that the random side of things, the disorderly side of things, could possibly win in the game of competition or I would rather call it collaboration between the two. When you lose sight of the fact that the order principle and the random principle go together, that's exactly the same predicament as losing sight of the fact that all individually delineated things and beings are connected underneath. You know, just like mountains stick out of the earth and there's a fundamental earth underneath them. So all of us, as different things, we stick out of reality and there's a continuity underneath, but you ignore that, you see. That's the thing that's left out. See, I'm just giving you many examples of the same principle. But really, deep down, we are, each one of us, everything that there is. Doing it this way, and then again that way, and then again another way, and that's what it keeps up doing forever and ever. Only, it has holidays, which are called deaths. You know in the story of the creation of the world in the Bible, God works for seven days and rests the seventh. It's necessary to have a holiday. Holiday is holy day. And uh, the Sabbath for the Jews is Saturday, for the Christians is Sunday, because Saturday is the last day of the week, but Sunday is the first day of the week. And it's a slight difference of alteration between a Jewish temperament and a Christian temperament. Some people like to take the holiday and then do the work. Other people like to do the work and then take the <laughs> holiday. <laughs> And since the Jews do the work first and then take the holiday, they're always a little up on the Christians in business. <laughs> but the point is that a holiday, this pause between something going on, is of the essence of the idea of a web. For example, there's an Irish, famous Irishman who's supposed to have described a net as a lot of holes tied together with string. <laughs> so the holes are very, very important. And uh, these are the holy days. You see the holes. This all goes together. <laughs> so there must be that interval. And it exists on all kinds of levels. It isn't simply that there is, for example, a sound that is sounded is a vibration and the sound goes on and off. The, every, everything that we call sound is sound silence. There is no such thing as pure sound. You couldn't hear it. What you hear is that tap, 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 tap against the eardrum. But it happens very fast, so that you get more of an impression of sound than you do of silence. But between every little undulation of sound, there is also an interval. When you listen to music, you hear a melody. But what you hear, actually, that makes the melody significant are the steps between the tones, what we call the intervals. And a person who doesn't hear intervals is tone deaf. He only hears noises. He doesn't hear the steps. So that interval between whatever happens is as important as what happens. So we'll call these two things, the sound and the silence, the life and the death, somewhat analogous in weaving to the warp and the woof. Now, look at the marvelous way in which warp and woof go together. A piece of cloth is an extraordinary thing when you consider it's made of a line of string. There's something that uh, always struck me as a child, 
fabulous. That string, just thread, could turn into cloth. Why should it hang together? How improbable. My mother was a very great artist in embroidery, did absolutely fabulous work. And uh, she could do everything with thread, sewing, knitting, embroidery, make tapestries, repair tapestries, oh, just fabulous work. So I, I've grown up in a background where thread is of enormous importance. She made a living this way for a while. So I was always amazed at the way, a, say, you take a ball of wool and with knitting needles, and suddenly it turns into a sweater. Fantastic. But I found out, you see, the secret of this, which is that it will do this, it will hold together by this combination of warp and woof, by this process where one thread goes under the other, omits the next, goes under the other, and then the next thing does the same thing but in the opposite way. Connect that. And they hold each other up. For example, you can put two sticks of wood and lean them against each other, and they'll stand up. You know, the Chinese character for man looks more or less like that. And although this is, a, this is simply the brush form, the brush abbreviation of what were originally the legs of a uh, little human stick figure, there's a story that Japanese children uh, sometimes learn from their mothers, that this, the reason this is the character for man is that two sticks <coughs> lent together, as I described, will keep each other up and the one depends on the other. It's mutual. And so in the same way, the existence of human beings depends on our supporting each other. Without that, no one of us can exist. But that, which may seem a little trite, a little sort of moralistic and so on, but it is absolutely fundamental that anything that there is, whenever we can say that something exists, existence is a function of relationship. Motion itself is a function of relationship. For example, uh, forgive me if some of you have heard this one before, but it's a very important basic lesson. If there is only one object, one small ball, in the middle of endless space. Nobody knows whether it's moving. Because you can't tell whether it's approaching anything or whether it's going away from anything, because there's nothing else. So in that state of affairs, no motion exists. But if we introduce a second ball into the picture, and the two either come towards each other or go away from each other, then we can say that both of them, or either of them, is in motion. We can't decide which is the one that's doing the moving. Because they, uh, it could be, could be one, could be the other. Now we'll put three balls into space. And we find two of them staying together, and the other one going away. Now it's up to the two of them to decide whether the other one is going away from them or they are going away from the other, because two is a majority in this case. And the vote always, of course, goes to the majority, the universe being basically a democratic organization. <laughs> and so it goes. Now, once you've got that, you can see that motion is a form of relationship. Or I, let me put it in another way. Energy is a form of relationship. If the universe is basically a play of energy, then you can say energy and relationship go together. 
Now, what is this saying? This is saying that being, existence itself, is relationship. Let's look at it in several other ways. You know the old question. If a tree crashes in a forest and there is nobody around to hear it, is there a noise? This question has been discussed in many futile ways. But noise, basically, is a state of affairs that requires an eardrum and an audio nervous system behind the eardrum. When the tree falls, it makes the air vibrate. If there is anywhere around an ear with the appropriate nervous system, there will be a noise. Because noise is a relationship between motion in the air and ears. If there is not any ear around, there won't be any noise, although there will be vibration in the air. And if there is some instrument around, such as a microphone attached to a tape recorder, which is a mechanical copy of a human ear, then, according to that, there will be noise. There will be a vibration. In the same way, let's suppose the sun sends out light into space. Now, the space surrounding the sun will be black darkness as if there were no light in it, unless a planet happens to float by. When a planet floats by, there will be light. In the darkness. But if there isn't anything to relate to the sun in that way, then comes no light. Now this goes right down to the root and ground of everything. It goes down to the essence of your nerves, of uh, your whole being. That it's all an interdependence. And that's why one of the basic symbols of the universe is the Chinese yin-yang symbol, uh, which you know is a circle with an S curve in the center. One side of the S is black, the other is white. And uh, so it makes, as it were, two commas or two fishes. And the eye of the fish is the opposite color. The white fish has a black eye, the black fish has a white eye. And these things are going like this, see? Curling in on each other. Now this thing is called a helix. And that is the fundamental form of the galaxies. The great nebulae we see out in space are doing this, curves. And this is basically, too, the position of sexual intercourse. This is, uh, this is lovemaking. And this is, you know, when you hold hands and, and so on. Uh, this is it. But there are two involved, and the two are secretly one. Now, this is what I really want you to understand. To get into the unitive world underneath, underlying and supporting the everyday practical world, there have to be certain alterations in one's common sense. Now, there are certain ideas, and beyond these ideas, certain feelings that are difficult to get across, not because they're intellectually complicated, not at all because of that, but because they're unfamiliar. They're strange. We haven't been brought up to accommodate them. In exactly the same way that in past times, people knew that the planets were supported in the sky because they were embedded in spheres of crystal. And if they weren't embedded in spheres of crystal, and of course you could see them because you could see through them, they would fall down on the earth. 
And now when astronomers finally suggested that there were no crystal spheres, people felt unbelievably insecure. See? They had a terrible time assimilating this idea. Now, do you see what it involves to assimilate a really new idea? You have to do quite a flip. For example, there are some people whose number systems only account for quantities. One, two, three, many. So they don't have any concept of four corners to a table. See, a table has many corners. And a uh, pile of pebbles is, in that sense, equivalent in manyness to the four corners of a table. Now, they have difficulty, you see, in beginning to assimilate the idea of counting through and numbering all those corners or all those pebbles. But we've done that. And so, to us, that is perfectly simple. But imagine the kind of mentality, the kind of person to whom that is not simple at all. Well, now, in exactly the same way, there is here what I'm trying to explain, a new idea that most people don't assimilate. And that is the idea of the total interdependence of everything in the world. The Buddhists in uh, Japan call it Jiji Muge. Jiji Muge, between thing and thing, between event and event, there is no block. And they represent this imagistically as a network. Imagine a multidimensional spider web covered in dew in the morning. And every single drop of dew on this web contains in it the reflections of all the other drops of dew. And of course, in turn, in every drop of dew that one drop reflects, there is the reflection of all the others again. And they use this image to represent the interdependence of everything in the world. In other words, if we give this dewdrop image, if we put it into a linguistic analogy, we would say this, words have meaning only in context. The meaning of any word depends upon the sentence or upon the paragraph in which it's found. So that if I say, this tree has no bark, that's one thing. And if I say, this dog has no bark, that's another thing. So you see always that the meaning of the word is, is in relation to the context. Now, in exactly the same way, the meaning as well as the existence of an individual person, an organism, is in relation to the context. You are what you are, sitting here at this moment in your particular kind of clothes and with the particular colors of your faces and your particular personalities, your family involvements, your business involvements, your neuroses and your everything. You are that precisely in relation to an extremely complex environment. So much so that if, let's take for example this piece of wood that forms a support to the beam out here. Now believe me, this is true. You can see that has little nubbles on it and so on. If it were not the way it is, you would not be the way you are. The line of connection between what is, it is, and you are, is very, very complicated. Also, we could say, if a given star that we observe didn't exist, you would be different from what you are now. I don't say you wouldn't exist, but you would exist differently. 
Uh, but the, you might say the connection is very faint, is something that you don't ordinarily have to think about. It's not important, but basically it is important. Only you say, I don't have to think about it, because it's there all the time. See, for example, the floor is underneath you all the time. Some sort of floor, some sort of earth. And you, re you really don't have to think about it. So it's just always there, it's always around. If, if you're, you become insensitive, you stop thinking about it. But there it is. And so in the same way, our subtle interdependence with, mind you, it's not just our plain existence, it's the kind of existence we have is dependent upon all these things. Also our plain existence, but that gets way down. But the, the fundamental thing is existence is relationship. In other words, if my finger up here is all alone and the wind doesn't move and nothing touches it, it stops knowing that it's there. But if something comes along and does immediately it's aware that it's there. So, <laughs> you see, it takes two. We could have so much fun, but it takes more than one. And she don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> but in this way, you see, what we call duality, you can see, can't you, how duality is fundamental. It takes two. But duality is always secretly unity. Take the contrast between the words we use, explicit and implicit. The very valuable words. What is explicit? What's on the outside? Let's say how we come on publicly. Explicitly, we are thus and so. We have a fight. Uh, we're in competition, say, in business, explicitly. But implicitly, we've worked this out we have agreed in a secret way that nobody knows about, that this competition is extremely valuable to both of us. And take it politically, for example. Let's take the situation of Russia versus the United States. Explicitly, in public, this has to be a big fight. These two ways of life, these two ideologies are opposed. They say, you know, we are... But behind the scenes, it's all been carefully worked out. You bet it has. That this opposition has to happen. Because our economy depends on it, and their economy depends on it, and everybody knows this who's, got, who's smart. But there are a lot of people who get taken in by the propaganda, and they should be taken in because that makes the thing work. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. But that's the way it goes. And everything works this way. There is, uh, for example, when swans start to mate, they're not sure what they're supposed to do. And they, they begin to fight. I had a long talk about this with, with C.G. Jung. He lived uh, on the edge of Lake Zurich, and he had a little summer house right on the water's edge, and there were many swans there. And I was getting up after, at the end of a conversation with him, and we were beginning to walk back to the main house, and I said, isn't it true that swans are monogamous? And he said, yes, uh, they are. He said, do you know, I have had most interesting relationships between these swans and many of my female patients who thought they were homosexual. I mean, Jung wasn't a... Uh, sexual snob. I mean, he, he understood all the legitimacy of all kinds of sexual variations. But he said, it has been a point of departure for our discussions. 
And he said, it's a very funny thing that when they begin to mate, they start fighting. And they don't know what it's all about, and then suddenly the fight turns into lovemaking. So that's what I mean. Underneath opposition, there is love. Underneath duality, there's unity. That Tweedledum and Tweedledee agreed to have a battle. So, you see, here's that weaving principle. The things hold together by over, under, under, over, over, under, under, over, over, under, under, over. And that creates a stuff, it creates a fabric, it creates clothing, it creates shelter, it creates what we call matter. Matter, mata, mother, and also the same word, maya, illusion. <laughs> See, the world as a marvelous illusion. Now, we've got to go into this. Look, look at another form of the thing. You can play it not only by two as one, but you can play it by three as one. You know the uh, trademark for Ballantine's Ale, which is three interlocked rings. Now, the way these rings are interlocked is such that they are joined only if the three of them are present. If you take one away, the other two fall apart. This is a very interesting phenomenon, but it can be created physically with uh, steel rings. Their, their cohesion depends on all three of them being present. Now, we have tried scientifically to understand the world and explain its mysteries by analyzing the smallest, smallest particles of things that exist. Inquiring down, 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 what is this thing we call flesh or call steel or stone? What is it made of? Go down into the midst of it. And that's given us a certain understanding. But only half of the understanding equally important is not what is the tiniest particle, but in what context is the tiniest particle. You see? In, in relation to what is it? Just as the word bark, as I showed you, has different meanings in different sentences, so cells, molecules, atoms, have different properties in different contexts. So what uh, the scientist equally needs to study is not simply what is anything when very, very minutely analyzed, but where is it? When is it? That makes all the difference. So do you see that a lot of people who get anxious when they hear that everything is relative have no, no need to get that anxious. Relativity isn't some kind of slippery morass in which all standards and all directions get lost. Relativity is really the soundest situation that there is. See, it's the, it's the one supporting the other. It's this thing. Do you know this? This is wonderful. X marks the spot. Imagine this going on and on. Supposing my finger were indefinitely long, both fingers, and they were doing this. See, they're just crossing each other. Now, on one side of it, it's a pair of scissors, and it cuts. What is it on the other side? Why, it's opening female legs, saying, please come in. This utter softness, utter receptiveness. On the other side, it's... <coughs> but on this side, it's... 
please, 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 yes. Welcome. <laughs> and everything's based on that. See, it's <laughs> this way. Sharpness, teeth, biting, spines, crab shells, all that kind of thing, you know. On the other side, it's the melting softness of life. See, they go together just like that. And goodness knows what it is on these outer two sides. I haven't, I haven't thought about that yet. <laughs> so, if you see that, if you, if you get that principle, you can feel yourself not sort of just rattling around in the world, as a kind of, um, you know, somebody who's been stuck down there. But you can feel yourself going on in absolutely exact relationship with everything around you. And this is very beautiful. It isn't just that you are here looking at what's out there like you might be photographing it with your eyes. It's that if that there wasn't there, you wouldn't be here. The outside thing that you see and the inside thing that you are are poles of the same magnet or back in front of the same coin, and without one there isn't the other. That means, of course, then, that we are living in the midst of a world of animals, vegetables, minerals, atmospheres, astronomical bodies that's highly intelligent. It's intelligence concentrated, crystallized in our brains. That's where it comes out, you see. In any field, let's say, let's take any field of forces. We take a chemical solution, and at certain critical points in this chemical solution, the crystals start to form. And so in the same way, the total intelligence of this whole universe crystallizes in human brains also in other kinds of brains. But that's where it really comes out. But it's the total intelligence of the whole field that does this. So we go with the whole thing, interdepend with it. We don't live in an environment which is just rock, just air, just atmosphere and so on. The environment's only like that when we think about it analytically and try to explain it. But when we think of, it isn't just rock and air, see, but those things go together. When you see the interconnectedness, when you see in the simplest way how flowers go with bees and other insects, they don't live without them. Humans go with cattle. They don't exist without them. Plants, etc., etc., etc. When you see the intervals, the significance of the relationships between these things, it's only then, when you see that, that you are aware of the melody. Go back to the illustration I gave of the person who can't hear melody, who's tone deaf. He hears only a succession of sounds because he's not aware of the intervals. Now, most people are brought up to be tone-deaf in respect to their own existence and the rest of the universe. They don't see the relationships. They are not aware of the unity. And so, once you, you spot that, you spot how everything goes with the thing. 
that you are one end and that out there is the other end, and they really go together, then you may be said to be living a harmonious life. This concludes Session 3 of Out of Your Mind, Essential Listening from the Alan Watts Audio Archives. Our program continues with Session 4. True presents Out of Your Mind, Essential Listening, from the Alan Watts Audio Archives, Session 4, The Web of Life, Part 2, with Alan Watts. In exploring the theme of the Web of Life, I have thus far discussed two principal topics. First, the web considered as selectivity, experience considered as what we pay attention to on the one hand and what we ignore on the other. And I showed how the way in which we pay attention to the world creates, isolates, I'm using that as a noun, isolates that we call particular things, events and persons, and they seem to be disconnected and to be alone because we ignore the connections between them. And I use the analogy of weaving where the threads go underneath and join on the back in a way that is not seen on the front. So you might say in the unconscious, although I don't particularly like that word because it makes it seem as if it was something rather dead, but on the unconscious side of life, as on the back of the weaving or the back of the embroidery, there are connections which are not published. Now, in the second part of the theme was the web as mutuality. When I discussed the way the existence of a web, the existence of cloth, or anything like that, depends on a mutual support of the warp and the woof. And this miraculous thing occurs, that when the things support each other, uh, being comes into being, cloth comes into being. And so in exactly the same way, our world is a manifestation of relativity. And this requires a balance, a combination, a relationship of opposites in every domain of life. And although these opposites are explicitly different and even antagonistic, they are implicitly one. And that's the secret. See, there are these two secrets that we went into. The connection between what are supposed to be separate things and events and the mutual unity between what are manifestly, that is to say openly, for purposes of publication, opposites. Now this afternoon I'm going to take two other aspects of the web. The web is a trap, like the spider's web is a trap for flies. Also, the lovely embroideries are worn by women as traps for men, from a certain, <laughs> from a certain point of view. And I want to consider the web as something playful. You see, there are so many ways of looking at it. And you will find that all these ways are, are right. But what we need is the fullness of the view. There are people, for example, who can see the web as a trap and get stuck with that. There are people to whom existence is simply hateful. They see it as nothing but a ghastly mistake. The Lord really erred when he created this world. 
because he, he arranged it in such a way that everything lives by eating something else. And what I'm doing is I'm describing a certain point of view, you see. I'm not exactly philosophizing, I'm describing a point of view. You can look at life in such a way that the whole thing is, a, is this ghastly mistake. For example, there is no such thing as genuine kindness or love. Everybody is really pretending that they are loving other people in order to get some advantage from them. And indeed, there is a point of view which occurs in certain forms of paranoia where people don't seem to be real. They are mechanisms. And you can think that out quite intensely with a good deal of intelligence. After all, if you start from a good old Darwinian or Freudian basis and see that man is a material machine and that the consciousness of man is simply a very involved and complicated form of chemistry, and that's it, what it is, you see. Well, then this awful uh, mechanical things, these uh, Frankensteins that everybody is, they come around and they say, well, I'm alive. I'm a human being. I have a heart. I love, I hate, I have problems, I, I feel. And you feel like saying, come off it. You're just a monster. Uh, and you put on this civilized act because really you're just a set of teeth on the end of a tube. <laughs> and you've got a ganglion behind those teeth, <laughs> which you call your brain or your so alleged mind. And this thing is really basically there for two purposes. One, to be cunning enough to get something to eat, to put down the tube, and the other, you know what, Mr. Freud's libido. And everything else, you see, can be construed as an elaborate, subtle way of pretending that that's not really what you want to do. But you do, but you put on a great show. Now, some people, according to this view, get mixed up. They so repress that what they really want to do is to eat and to screw that they get involved in higher things that are the masks for these activities <laughs> and uh, think that that's the real purpose of life. And then they become what's called neurotic. And uh, <laughs> because they get involved in being pure camouflage. So that's what's called escaping from the facts, not looking at life, not looking at reality correctly. Now, this is a very strange thing, you see, that it is partly true that the universe, so far as its biological aspect is concerned, is this weird system that lives by everybody eating everybody else. Only what we do to maintain what is called order and civilization is that various species make agreements, as it were, that they won't eat each other. They'll cooperate and so be an enormous gang which can uh, beat down the others. So the human being is the most successful so far of this gangster arrangement. We are the most predatory monsters on earth and we have cooperated to assault the fish and the vegetables and the chickens and the cows and everything, you see? Only we do it by not letting our left hand know what our right hand doeth. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, unless gentlemen happen to be prone to going hunting as a sport, they don't see their food killed. They don't see the slaughterhouse. And so what you get in the butcher in the market, a steak, you know, is a thing in its own right. It has nothing to do with a cow. <laughs> uh, a steak is a thing shaped thus and so, and it uh, looks as if it might be like a banana or something like that, you know, and nobody worries. And when a fish is served up. It does indeed look like a fish, but it's not the squiggly, squirmy fish that comes out on the end of a fisherman's line. You know, when you really fish, you realize that the fish doesn't like it very much. <laughs> now, there is that absolutely extraordinary side of things that is really terrifying. And so, let me repeat the illustration I used of the cross in the net where one side of it is scissors that cut and eat teeth that chew 
and get this thing in. And the opening side of it is like James Joyce's in Ulysses, the girl who says yes, and I said yes, yes, yes. She wants to be absolutely ravaged by her man, you see. So it's open, open, open. But now comes the, the, the if we take the dark view of things, the horrible view, Excuse me if I go into some rather gr grisly details, but have you ever heard of a vagina dentata? That is the idea that in the sexual organ of the woman there are teeth. And a lot of men have this fantasy and so are rendered impotent. They don't make love. Because they feel that the price of this blessed experience, this creative experience, this loving experience, is you're going to get trapped. You're going to get emasculated. You're going to lose your precious member. And uh, this is a very ancient fantasy. It appears throughout all known history. Because this is simply the woman's come on, where she attracts, but she's out really to get you. She is basically a spider mother, you see, <laughs> who is, is selfish and uh, doesn't really love you, not really, but says she does. And, of course, there are on the other side all the tricks of the men, which go without mention. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a view of the world as a system of mutual exploitation and of maximal selfishness. Now, it's a very profitable view to explore. Everybody should do in their lifetime sometime two things. One is to consider death, to observe skulls and skeletons, and to wonder what it will be like to go to sleep and never wake up. Never. That uh, is the most, is a very gloomy uh, thing for contemplation, but it's like manure. Just as manure fertilizes the plants and so on, so the contemplation of death and the acceptance of death is very highly generative of creative life. You get wonderful things out of that. And the other thing to contemplate is to follow the possibility of the idea that you are totally selfish that you don't have a good thing to be said for you at all. You are a complete, utter rascal. <laughs> now, the, the Christians have avoided this, because although they say in their Episcopalian form of confession that we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep, and we have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts, too much, you know. Uh, we have offended against <laughs> thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But <laughs> it ought to be different, and we're going to do our best to amend with the help of God's grace. And that is a real con act, because uh, if you equate health with genuine love and perfect unselfishness, then in that sense there is no health in us when we look at ourselves from this point of view. Now, when you go deeply into the nature of selfishness, what do you discover? You say, I love myself, I seek my own advantage. Now, what is the self that I love? What do I want? And that becomes an increasingly ever-deepening puzzle. Now, I've often referred to this when you say to somebody else, I love you. It's always rather disconcerting to the person to whom you say that. If you imply that you love them with a pure, disinterested and holy love, they automatically suspect it as being a little bit phony. But if you say, I love you so much I could eat you, that's an expression, it's a way of saying to a person, you attract me so much that I can't help it. 
I'm absolutely bowled over by you, I'm gone. And people like that. Then they feel they're really being loved, that it's absolutely genuine. But now, I love you so much I could eat you. Now what the devil do I want? I certainly don't want to eat the girl in the sense of literally devouring her, because then she'd disappear. <laughs> ah, but I love myself. And what is me? How do, in what way do I know me? When it suddenly occurs to me that I know me only in terms of you. See, when I think of anything that I know and that I like, then it's always something that can be viewed as other than me. I can never get to look at me, real me. It's always behind. It's always hidden. And I really don't know it well enough to know whether I love it or not. Maybe I don't. Maybe it's an appalling mess. But certainly the things I do love and that I want from a selfish point of view, when I really think about them, they're all something else that's in a way outside me. Now, we saw that there is a reciprocity, a total mutual interdependence between what we call the self and what we call the other. That's the warp and the woof. And so, if you are perfectly honest about loving yourself, and you don't pull any punches, you don't pretend that you are anything other than exactly what you are, you suddenly come to discover that the self you love, if you really go into it, is the universe. You don't like all of it. You're selective about it, as we saw in the beginning. Perception is selection. But on the whole, you love yourself in terms of what is other. Because it's only in terms of what is other that you have a self at all. So then, I feel that the, one of the very great things that C.G. Jung contributed to mankind's understanding was the concept of the shadow. That everybody has a shadow. And that the main task of the psychotherapist is to do what he called to integrate the evil to, as it were, put the devil in us in its proper function. Because, you see, it's always the devil, the unacknowledged one, the outcast, the scapegoat, the bastard, the bad guy, you see, the black sheep of the family. It's always from that point, that, which we could call the fly in the ointment, you see, that generation comes. In other words, uh, in the same way as in the drama, uh, to have the play it's necessary to introduce a villain. It's necessary to introduce a certain element of trouble. So in the whole scheme of life uh, there has to be the shadow, because without the shadow there can't be the substance. So this is why there is a very strange association between crime and all naughty things and holiness. You see, holiness is way beyond being good. Good people aren't necessarily holy people. A holy person is one who is whole, who has, as it were, reconciled his opposites. And so there's always something slightly scary about holy people. And other people react to them in very strange ways. They can't make up their minds whether they're saints or devils. And so holy people have throughout history always created a great deal of trouble, along with their creative results. <laughs> Take Jesus, for example. The trouble that Jesus created is absolutely incalculable. <laughs> Think of the Crusades, the Inquisition, the heaven only knows what's gone on in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Very remarkable. Freud's a big troublemaker, uh, as well as a great healer, you see. It all goes together. 
So the holy person is scary because he is like the earthquakes, or better still, he's like the ocean. See, the ocean, on a lovely sunny day, you can say, oh, isn't that gorgeous? And you can go into it and relax and float around. But boy, when the storm comes, does that thing get mad and terrifying. So there is in us the ocean, you see. And Jung felt that the whole point was to bring the two together and uh, by a kind of a fantastic honesty to penetrate one's own motivations to the depths. Jung had a tremendous humor. And he knew that nobody can be completely honest. That you will try and you'll have a great deal of success in uh, exploring your motivations and your dark unconscious depths but there will be a certain point at which you will say, well, I've had enough of that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and do you see how, in a strange way, there's a certain sanity in that? When a person indulges in a certain kind of duplicity, of deception, there is something, you all laughed when I said that, there was something humorous about it. And this humor is a very funny thing. Basically, humor is an attitude of laughter about oneself. There is malicious humor, or, which is laughing at other people. But real deep humor is laughter at oneself. Now, why fundamentally do you laugh about yourself? What makes you laugh about yourself? Isn't it because you know that there is a big difference between what goes on the outside and what goes on the inside. <laughs> that if I hint, you see, that your inside is the opposite of your outside, it makes people laugh. If I don't do it unkindly. If I get up in the attitude of a preacher and say, uh, you're a bunch of miserable sinners and you ought to be different, nobody laughs. <laughs> But if I say, well, after all, boys will be boys and girls will be girls, and we, we all know, then, then, then people laugh. Now, you see, what's, what's happening when we do that? Now, I passed you around a lot of embroidery to look at before we started. And I'm perfectly sure that you got the point, that there's a big difference between the front and the back. <coughs> In some forms of embroidery, the back is very different from the front because people take shortcuts. In the front, everything is orderly and it is supposed to be kind of messy on the back side. See, which side will you wear? You've got to be sure you get the front in the front and have the back in the back. The back has all the little tricks in it, all the shortcuts, all the lowdown that people don't acknowledge, see? And it's exactly the same with the way we live. You know, like sweeping the dust under the carpet in a hurry just before the guests come. I mean, we do ever so many things like that. And if you don't do it, if you don't think you do it, and you think, well, really, I, my embroidery is the same on both sides, see? Well, you're deceiving yourself. Because what you're doing is you're taking the shortcuts in another dimension, which you're keeping out of consciousness. Everybody takes the shortcuts. Everybody plays tricks. Everybody has in himself an element of duplicity, of deception. Because you see, from this point of view that I am discussing, where the web is the trap, to be is to deceive. Think of camouflage, the chameleon who changes its color. Think of the butterfly pretending it has eyes, Think of the flower saying to the bee, like my honey. <laughs> the bee says, wow. 
But then that means that the bee has to be, and it has to go on living, and all the trouble it takes to go around collecting honey and raising other bees and organizing itself and doing that dance which tells the other bees where there's more honey. There's all that stuff to do. But the flower was deceptive. Now, in the same way, I've often said, life is, is a drama, and a drama is a deception. It's a big act. When you peel an onion and you don't really understand the nature of an onion, you might look for the pit in the center, like any ordinary fruit has. But the onion doesn't have a center. It's all skins. And so when you get right down, there's nothing but a bunch of skins. You say, well, that was a kind of disappointing. <laughs> but of course, you have to understand that the skins were the part that you eat. Well, in rather the same way, you see, you find when you explore yourself uh, and your motivations and you go through and through and you try to find out that thing which is really genuine. That's why in Zen discipline, they give you koans which require a perfectly genuine act, an act of total and absolute sincerity. And people knock themselves out trying to do this thing, but they always know that the master's going to catch them. Because he reads their thought. You know that story of um, von Kleist about the man who had a fight with a bear and the bear re could read his thoughts so that the only way of hitting the bear was to do so not on purpose. Because the bear would know in advance. So it's the same in working with a Zen master. You have to do the genuine act not on purpose. But since you are put in a situation where it's rather formal, and you're supposed to do it on purpose. You're stuck, you see. So you explore the onion, and you go in and in and in, and then you find, well, uh, it's all a deception. Now then the question arises, who's deceiving who? Who's fooling who? I'm fooling me? What is fooling? Fooling is playing like you're there when you're not. You know, getting somebody else to answer your name in the roll call. <laughs> so, we're all, you see, this is the metaphysical basis of it. This is what the Hindus mean by maya, the world illusion. The world is playing it's there when it isn't. And it's a trap and it sucks you in, and you can't get out of it. And it's a thorough big trap, too. But always, when you get an idea like this, or a feeling like this, follow it to its extreme. Don't back out from it. If you find you're selfish, go to the extreme of what selfishness means. Confusion largely results from not following feelings or ideas to their depth. You know, people think they want to be immortal. They'd like to live forever. Do you really want to do that? Think about it. Really go into it, what it would be like. People say they want this, that, and the other. They want this kind of car, they want this kind of dress, or so on, and um, this much money, and so on. It's always a good idea to think it right through. What it would involve to be in that situation, to have those desires fulfilled. Also, when you form a relationship to another person, think it through too, you see? How inconvenient could they be? <laughs> However attractive. And uh, always turn the em embroidery round and look at the underside, but don't get caught doing it. See, that's something one does on the side, in secret. Because otherwise you play the game that everything is as it's supposed to be on the front. But that makes you humorous, and that makes you human. Out of Your Mind now continues with the next lecture from the Web of Life Lecture Series.
Now, summing up, we've discussed the web from three points of view. As an analogy of the selective operation of our senses and mind, whereby certain things in the world are picked out as significant according to certain game rules. The game that we are playing mostly is the survival game. That is to say, the game ought to go on. Only the way we play the survival game has a, a kind of element in it which makes it difficult because we tend to say the first rule of this game is that it's serious. And that messes the whole thing up. So you have to watch out, in other words, when you play for contradictory game rules, self-contradictory game rules, because if you get mixed up into them, the game ceases to be worth the candle. You start straining at doing something, and it just isn't worth it. Then the second thing that we observed was the web as an analogy of mutual interdependence. We could call it the idea that all existence is relative, that all existence is transactional. The transaction being typically exemplified by, say, the operation of buying and selling, in which there can be no buying without somebody selling and there can be no selling without somebody else buying. That kind of interdependence of the inside going together with the outside. What is in you going together with what is outside you is absolutely fundamental to existence. It is existence. Existence is relativity. Then we explored the web as a trap. The spider's web. Won't you come into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. And we saw what happens if you look at all of life from the point of view that it is original selfishness and original hunger. And we found that if you take that point of view to its ultimate extreme, it dissolves. And it isn't so bad after all. There's a famous comment that R. H. Blythe made on the passage in Macbeth where Shakespeare says, it is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. And Blythe says, when it's put that way, it doesn't seem so bad after all. <laughs> I remember that I had a Zen master friend who wrote a letter to a friend of mine, which was passed on to me, saying that Oh, the greatest writers, th this friend of mine was aspiring to be a writer, and he was trying to write novels that would put across Buddhism to people. You know, sugar the pill. And my Zen master friend didn't approve of this at all. He said, don't write any story to people. Write it to the great sky. Because all the real masters of literature, especially novelists and storytellers, are great masters of nonsense. Think of Lewis Carroll. You can uh, use Lewis Carroll, and he did use Alice in Wonderland, as a Zen textbook. Because twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. And that's, uh, that's Zen. I had a discussion with a great master in Japan on the last visit there. And uh, we were talking about the various people who are working to translate the Zen books into English. And uh, he said, that's a waste of time. If you really understand Zen, he said, you can use any book. You could use the Bible. You could use Alice in Wonderland. You could use the dictionary. Because, he said, the sound of the rain needs no translation. So what does the rain say? Evening rain. It is the banana leaf that speaks of it first. You see, that's the point. And all the talk in the world 
doesn't get it unless you listen to the talk in a new way. The sound of the rain needs no translation. So you see, there's something going on. This web may be looked at as, a, as pattern. And the world is basically patterning. What else do you do when you come to think of it? When you eat, you uh, are turning food into the pattern of your skeleton, your muscles, and your nervous system. That's a pattern. And you say, you see, basically, hooray for that pattern. That's great. It's terribly interesting. But then you want other patterns. You like to look through a microscope and see the patterns that exist in the small world. You like to look through a kaleidoscope or a telidoscope and see the patterns. You like to have paintings around and see the patterns. You like to watch the water play. You want to watch the birds go and the clouds and all that. Fascinating patterns. And that really does, doesn't it, seem to be the point. I mean, what do you do when you're very rich and you want, uh, let's take some rascal of ancient times who became very rich by all sorts of skullduggery and uh, warfare and so on. He got himself a suit of armor, a beautiful sword. And he had the armorer make the most intricate patterns, arabesques, of inlaid gold on the steel. Why? Because it's, as they say among the Pennsylvania Dutch, it's for nice. <laughs> it's a great thing to have all that jazz. And that's what we go for. What do people do most of the time when they, what would they like to do, really? What's your idea of heaven? When people are unoccupied, as far as I can make out, they get together and they sing and dance. Or else watch somebody else do it. Nowadays we live in a non-participative culture and we don't do very much singing and dancing. We are lugubrious. But we watch other people do it on television. What we really are interested in is to be able to spend all the time going to hoo da ba da da boo dee dee da boo ba dee boo doo dee doo dee doo doo chee ko boo 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 you know something like this, and that's what our hearts doing, that's what our lungs are doing, that's what our eyeballs are doing, and it's what all these fantastic capillaries of the veins are doing. They're going just doo dee boo doo ha ba 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 boo ba dee 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 dee. See, and that's the point. Now the thing is ought this to be allowed. <laughs> you know, a dare we admit it. <laughs> because we've been brought up, you see, in a cultural context in which the universe is presided over by somebody serious. And it's only very, very occasional obscure references in the Jewish and Christian scriptures to the idea that God dances. Of course, in Hindus, they know Shiva dances, and all the gods dance, and they're represented in the, in the dance. But in our way of looking at things, no. Back deep down in there is something that you must respect with a very, very, you, you, mustn't, you mustn't laugh in church, especially if you got in front of the throne of heaven. Everybody would be dead silent. Wow, you see, I mean, that's really serious. Here is the Father Almighty world without end. And you watch out, don't you? laugh. Why not? Because Father Almighty, world without end, is a very insecure fellow. <laughs> and uh, if anybody laughed, he might feel uneasy, you know, that there was something, uh, something wrong going on, <laughs> that someone challenged his power. 
so he, he is a is a funny fellow, you see, as we've mythologized ultimate reality in the form of this cosmic uh, grandpapa who is also a king and is demanding above all things reverence and respect. So it's difficult for us because of that cultural heritage to accept, to accommodate our common sense to the idea that the web might basically be playful. That it might be like somebody saying, won't you come and play with me, a child? And the other child uh, has some little hesitation. I don't know whether I ought to play with you. You come from the wrong side of the tracks. Or um, I don't feel like playing today. I feel serious. I don't think play is important. We ought to do something real, like uh, wash the dishes for mother. Who, incidentally, has forgotten that the whole point of washing the dishes is playful. You know, uh, you don't wash the dishes f for a serious reason. You, you like the table to look nice, you know. You don't want to serve up the dishes for d dinner with all the leavings of breakfast still lying on them. Uh, so why do you want the table to look nice? Well, again, it's for nice, you see. It's, uh, it's, uh, you like the pattern on it that way. People get terribly compulsive about doing these things. And they think that uh, going on arranging the patterns of life is something that's a duty. That means a debt that you owe it to yourself or to your family or to someone or other. You're in debt. See, that's the trouble. When a child comes into the world, the parents play an awful game on it. Instead of being honest, they say, we've made such great sacrifices for you. Here we are, we've supported you, we've uh, paid for your education, and you're an ungrateful little bastard. And uh, the child feels terribly guilty because what we do is we build into every human being the idea that existence is guilt. The, the existentialists make a big thing of this and you watch out for them because they're hoaxes. And they say that guilt is ontological. If you're not feeling guilty, you're not human. And that was because Papa and Mama said, look at all the trouble you've caused us. You shouldn't dare to exist. You have no rights. But maybe we'll give you some out of the generosity of our heart so that you'll be permanently indebted to us. And so everybody goes around with that sort of thing in their, in their background unless they had different kinds of papas and mamas who didn't play that trick on them. But so many papas and mamas do do that. And if they don't do it, somebody else does it. Auntie comes around and says you don't realize what your father and mother have done for you. You think you know you can just stay around here and goof off, but they have sweated blood to uh, give you your clothes and food and so on, and you, you ought to be grateful for it. But that's not the way to make people grateful. They won't be grateful that way. They'll imitate gratefulness. They'll go and put on a big show and say, oh, thank you so much, I feel so indebted to you, and so on and so forth, and they'll make it look good. But it isn't real. Because, actually, one's father and mother had a great deal of fun bringing you into being, or we hope they did. And they wanted to do that the worst way. <laughs> they have no reason to complain about all these things and try and make the children feel guilty. But you see, it is an amazing thing in our culture that everybody is afflicted with ontological guilt. For example, if a policeman comes to the door, everybody is instantly frightened. You wonder, what on earth have I done? And there are certain clergy who are absolute experts in making you feel guilty. They are really marvelous. And there are clergy of all kinds, for all classes, and for all levels of intelligence. <laughs> they can make you feel real guilty. <laughs> Only you have to watch always what games people are playing. Now you see the thing is that really is a puzzle is that they don't admit they're playing games. 
And when a person is playing games and doesn't admit that they're playing games, then you have some kind of a of a trickster who um, isn't really being fair to you. Now, of course, the game, that this game is not a game, has a certain kind of a fascinating quality to it. How mixed up can we all get? Let's try. See? That, that is that certain possibility in that. I, I would like to go insane and be as insane as anybody has ever been and uh, be the farest out crazy nut in the world. See? That's a game. But it's not a good game. It's a, a game being played by a person who didn't really understand that everyday life was a game too. And I think the most important thing is to admit this. All really humane people admit that they're rascals. That's, you see, on the side of the not respectable, the selfish. But so also, all humane people should admit that they're jokers, that they're playing games and playing tricks, that I am doing it on you. I am most ready to admit this. I hoaxed you all into coming here to tell you what? <laughs> It was a trap, you see, but I'm going to make it an entertaining trap so that uh, you won't feel so badly about it. Uh, now, this is philosophy, but I think philosophy is like music. You go to a concert and you listen to somebody play Bach or Mozart or Beethoven. Now, what's all that about? You know, it isn't about anything except you know, that's what it's about. And so, in the same way, uh, the, as I conceive my work as a philosopher, I'm simply pointing out that existence is the same kind of a thing as a Bach invention. It's going this way and that way and hills and waters going t -t 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 all out there and the fish are going around in it and uh, breeding and the ducks are doing this that and the other and that's the same thing as dee 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 see so uh, if you can uh, admit that that that's what it's all about you have a little problem because there's not only the threat that it really might be serious and that you shouldn't be laughing about this <laughs> but there's also a kind of opposite then are you saying it's merely just fiddling around see? I mean you're saying it's only a game is that all there is to it well now what do you think you see, this again is a question that everybody has to think things through. What did you want? <laughs> Didn't you want a game? Did you want it to be serious in the end? What, I mean, think about the question. What kind of a, a thing would you like God to be? What would you like to do for eternity? Really? Here is... Uh, Jan van Eyck, who paints the eschatological picture of the Last Judgment. What a strange man he must have been. For here is heaven above and hell below. And in heaven, here's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, all there together, and the Virgin Mary, and the Apostles, and they're all sitting in committee. And they have an aisle, you know, just like in church, and there they are facing each other, and they're all sitting there very solemnly. And I don't know what it's about. But below, right at the end of the aisle, you see, where all these apostles are sitting, is St. Michael. A rather gorgeous figure in beautiful armor with wings. And underneath him is a bat-winged skull. And beneath those bat wings, though, all horror is let loose. Michael is about to slosh that skull, see, with his sword. But below, ooh, there are nude 
bodies, some of them pretty comely, and they're all squirming in there, and they're being eaten by worms. And they're eating the worms, and there's a kind of a mush. It's like the sort of situation you find when you turn up a big rock, and there's all that going on underneath. <laughs> now, there's no question whatever that Van Eyck, the painter, had more fun painting that part of the picture than he did painting the top part. <laughs> so in the same way with, the, with Hieronymus Bosch and with Bruegel, they painted every kind of weird surrealistic deviltry going on, and they really loved it, but they couldn't admit it. Now, the only time when the holy people had a ball was when, for example, the Islamic artists made arabesques and the Celtic artists made um, fantastically intricate lattices to decorate the margins of their gospels and uh, missals. They are unbelievably beautiful, or take stained glass or something like that, but what are they doing? What's it all about? So when you ask the question, then what will you do in heaven? And the thing you want to do, of course, is to get mixed up in this, this little, see, like, it's like the musician, he likes to take a melody, then he likes to put another melody that fits in with it, and another one that fits in with both, and then a fourth one, and arrange them together, and he invents an instrument like an organ that he plays with two hands, then he adds foot pedals so that he can play with his two feet. And he can get this hand doing one rhythm, this doing another, this doing another, and this doing another. See, that makes it complicated. And so when drummers get together and play, somebody starts out with a certain rhythm, and then that rhythm has holes in it. In other words, it has certain silences, and the next drummer fills those silences in an interesting way. He counts and picks out a pattern. And what do you imagine DNA is? The basic form of biological existence. Now, DNA is like a necklace, like Charlotte's wearing, with different kinds of beads in it. And according to the order and the way those beads are arranged, so you get genes, and so you get the particular form of life that emerges from those genes. So what we're doing, basic down, way down, is saying, she loves me, she don't, she'll have me, she won't, she would if she could, but she can't, you see? <laughs> or, <laughs> Tinker, Taylor, Solar, Savior, Rich Man, Poor Man, Beggar Man, Thief. Well, this is the way life is going on. <laughs> and <laughs> as a result comes all this. You see? The question is then, you see, in your heart of hearts, you can take the attitude that all this is terrible, or that it's dreadfully serious. You see, you can play comedies, you can play tragedies, uh, farces, histories and romances and all that kind of thing, and you can take these various attitudes to it. But if you are awakened, and as it were, you've been let into the secret, which is what we've been talking about, see? Because the web is also the curtain, you know, the veil. The veil which hides the face of God from the angels, you see? There's always this veil. That's why we like a striptease. Because there's an implication of this... You should never give the show completely away. There always should be a little bit of a veil left, you see. There always is. Because even if you find the striptease artist gets completely naked, there's really something hidden. What's the motivation? What sort of a person is she? Would I really like to embrace her? Or would she have bad breath? You know, or something, and uh, you, you never really know. You never really get to the bottom. That's why everybody, all men, poets, say that women are basically mysterious, and they ought to be. So are men basically mysterious, from women's point of view, although they play that they're not. <laughs> See, this is the way it goes. Men are supposed to be very open, and they say, well, of a certain situation, this is the way it is. After all, it's perfectly rational. It's just, a matter of practical affairs, and women say, well, she say, I'm not quite as articulate as you are, but I know there's something you've left out, but I can't explain it. <laughs> and by this means, everything is kept going. <laughs> so, 
what I'm saying is I think this. I'm trying to share with you a certain style of life and an attitude to life and an insight. Well, I've taken you on one side and said, listen kids, things aren't what they seem. Don't be fooled. There's a big deception going on and you're involved in it, but I just thought you ought to know it. And enjoy it, see? I, I'm terribly puzzled about the way people go out of their way to disenjoy themselves. They take so much trouble about it. Did you ever read H.L. Mencken's essay called A Libido for the Ugly? And it describes a Pennsylvania mining town which isn't exactly totally impoverished. I mean, they can build things and they uh, have enough money to do this, that and the other. But they, he describes how they made a, a church out of yellow stone that's so awful that it looks like a Presbyterian with a grin. <laughs> and all around you have only to look and you see this perfect passion for making the world look grisly. And it isn't only job builders and uh, garage owners who do this kind of thing, it's also people who profess to be painters. They're actually using excrements for painting in Paris today uh, on the theory that the world is shot to pieces and that the, since the artist is a representative of his times, he ought to show the times as they really are as a social critic. And so he makes the most weird I mean, he paints Campbell's soup can, and then, and then he makes music that shrieks and screams in the most... Uh, he, he just goes out of his way to make it sound as ugly as he possibly can manage. And the ingenuity is about that is endless. Because that is the times. He's a critic, you see. Instead of being somebody who reveals. Now, you see, let's take you the, the sort of the character of the Pied Piper. The person who brings you an invitation to dance. I would say then, you see, there is going to be a dance this evening, and I would like you all to come, you know. That's the spirit in which I invite you to a seminar. I am not inviting you in the spirit of saying, now, uh, we're going to have to discuss some very grave matters, and you ought to be awake to all these things and arouse your social conscience, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, because when you get through with all that, then what? When you get through with feeding the hungry and clothing the naked, and we are making great strides with automation and technology in abolishing poverty totally, then what are we going to do? Well, you see, if you've got all these people clothed and fed and so on, and then they say, well, now what next? If you've got a kind of Quakerish state of mind, you don't know what to do. Well, uh, feed and clothe somebody else. You see? Get busy. But then, where is that leading? So you see, to spread joy, you have to have it. To impart delight, you have to be more or less delightful. And to be delightful is not some factor of trying to make yourself look delightful. It is to do things that are delightful to you. You become thereby delightful to others. That's to say, people who are interesting are people who are interested. Any person, for example, who is constantly thinking about all sorts of other things and other people and so on, because they're fascinating, becomes a fascinating person. But a person who doesn't think about anybody else and who's got very little going on inside their skull is boring. So in other words, your engagement with the external world, the more you are involved, the more your personality is enriched. But if you try to enrich your personality, by taking a course in how to win friends and influence people. 
or how to be a real person, you become just a washout. <laughs> because you will be in a kind of small circle. You'll be, as it were, you'll be like somebody trying to get a good nutrition by biting his nails. And then the fingers next. You know, and then half an arm gone and so on. And uh, you're, you're entirely nourishing yourself with yourself. Now, of course, on a vast scale, the universe does that. It eats itself up. That's why the symbol of the snake swallowing its tail is a very fundamental, archaic symbol of life. But the way it's done is that the snake has in some part of the ring a place where it's not sensitive. It's called the unconscious. Where it doesn't know that what comes to it in the form of food is actually what left it in the form of excrement. That thing is, don't mention it. After all, as the Lord said at the beginning of the universe, you must draw the line somewhere. <laughs> and so, as a result of there always being a kind of gap, that's the gap, you know, like where the electric spark jumps. That's the thing behind your head, behind your eyes, that you could never get to look at. It's the gap. And because of that little gap, the circle doesn't just revolve in a dull way, just go round and round and round like a boring thing. It has rhythm. See, if I say, Yoi! No rhythm. See? It's just one long sound. After a while we say, oh, cut it out. <laughs> uh, or, or we just become insensitive to it. But what we want to hear is a break in it, you see. And we want to hear it go on and off and vanish and come back again and so on. And it sets up a rhythm. That becomes interesting. That's putting gaps between, you see. We need those gaps. So now you see it, now you don't. Now you see it, now you don't. Oh, that's pretty dull. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to have you see it three times and then with a regular not see it between them. Then there's going to be a longer not see it after that one. <laughs> And then I'm going to do something very complicated after that so that you don't, don't really know when it's going to come next. So there's going to be a surprise. You know how we all do that? And interesting people are those who do this in very involved ways. Dull people sort of people who put their hats on absolutely straight, uh, are the kind of people, for example, who have the same meal every day, exactly the same thing, always. See? Have no in inventiveness. They have the same routine, they go to the same office, they answer the same kind of letters, and that's that. See? But then, if they want to start up a more interesting kind of business and make more money, then they have to figure out... Let's take the people who make clothes. They figure out fashion. It's going to be a new thing for ladies, a new style this fall. We're going to make them do long skirts instead of the short skirts, middle skirts. And the skirts go like this. Then finally they thought about having topless women. Um, <laughs> they're going to play around with that and have an absolutely scandalous ball. But that's the whole thing, you see. It's this thing of rhythm. And Yes, you ask, well, I see that. What is doing this rhythm? Or who, after all, am I? And as you explore deeper and deeper and deeper into the nature of yourself, you find that you're a rhythm doing a rhythm. And behind that, there's another rhythm doing a rhythm. Your vibrations. And once again, you meet our friend, the onion. And who, who is doing all this? Why, he disappeared came around, and there it was, and uh, we were looking for him, and he vanished. And then just when we weren't looking for him again, there he is. But uh, every time we try to see, he isn't there. Now do you see that? That that situation is what's called life. The 
This concludes session four of Out of Your Mind, Essential Listening from the Alan Watts Audio Archives. Our program continues with session five. presents Out of Your Mind, Essential Listening from the Alan Watts Audio Archives, Session 5, The Inevitable Ecstasy with Alan Watts. This seminar is about a very sticky problem. problem to which the Buddha primarily addressed himself, which is that of agony, suffering. But before we get into that, we have to be clear about certain basics. And these basics have to do not so much with concepts and ideas as they do with the state of mind. You could call it also a state of feeling, a state of sensation, a state of consciousness. And we need to understand that, even be in that, before we can really go very far. And this is an extraordinarily difficult state of mind to talk about, even though in its nature it's extremely simple. Because It is, in a way, like we were when we were babies. When we hadn't been told anything and didn't know anything other than what we felt and we had no names for it. Now, of course, as we grow older, we learn to differentiate one thing from another, one event from another, and above all, ourselves from everything else. Well and good provided you don't lose the foundations. Just as mountains are differentiated, but they're all based on the earth, so the multiple things of this world are differentiated. But they have, as it were, a basis. There is no word for that basis, not really, because words are only for distinctions. And so there can't really be a word, not even an idea, of the non-distinction. We can feel it, but we can't think it. But we don't feel it like an object. You feel you're alive. You feel you're conscious, but you don't know what consciousness is because consciousness is present in every conceivable kind of experience. It's like the space in which we live, which is everywhere. It's like a fish being in water, and presumably a fish doesn't know it's in the water, because it never goes out. A bird presumably knows nothing of the air, and we really know nothing of consciousness, and we pretend space isn't there. (laughs) So, however, when you grow up and become fascinated, which is really the right word, spellbound, enchanted, by all the things that adults wave at you. You forget the background. And you come to think that all the distinctions which you've been learning are the supremely important things to be concerned with. You become hypnotized, just in the same way as when the beak of a chicken is put to a chalk line, it gets stuck on that line. And so when we are told to pay attention to what matters, we get stuck with it, and that's what in Buddhism is called attachment. Attachment doesn't mean that you enjoy your dinner or that you enjoy sleeping or beauty. Those are responses 
of our organism in its environment as natural as feeling hot near a fire or cold near ice. So are certain responses of fear or of sorrow. They are not attachment. Attachment is exactly translated by the modern slang term hang up. It's a kind of stickiness or what in psychology would be called blocking when you are in a state of wobbly hesitation not knowing how to flow on. That's attachment, what is meant by the Sanskrit word klesha. So when the chicken has its beak put to the chalk line, it's got a hang up. It's stuck on that line. And so in the same way we get a hang up on all the various things that we are told as we grow up by our parents, our aunts and uncles, our teachers, and above all by our peer group. And the first thing that everybody wants to tell us is the difference between ourselves and the rest of the world, and between those actions which are voluntary and those which are involuntary, what we do on the one hand and what happens to us on the other. And this is, of course, immensely confusing to a small child because it's told to do all sorts of things that are really supposed to happen, like going to sleep, like having bowel movements, like uh, loving people, like not blushing, stopping being anxious, and all sorts of things like that. So what happens is this. The child is told in some that we, your parents, elders and betters, command you to do what will please us only if you do it spontaneously. <laughs> <laughs> and no wonder everybody's completely confused we go through life with that burden on us <laughs> so we therefore develop this curious thing we, we, we develop a thing which is called an ego now I've got to be very clear to you what I mean by an ego An ego is not the same thing as a particular living organism. For my philosophy, the particular living organism, which is inseparable from a particular environment, that is to say from the universe as centered here and now, is something real. It isn't a thing. I call it a feature of the universe. But what we call our ego is something abstract, which is to say it has the same order and kind of reality as an hour or an inch or a pound or a line of longitude. It is for purposes of discussion. It is for convenience. In other words, it is a social convention that we have what is called an ego. But the fallacy that all of us make is that we treat it as if it were a physical organ, as if it were real in that sense, when in fact it is composed on the one hand of our image of ourselves, that is our idea of ourselves, as when we say to somebody, you must improve your image. Now this image of ourselves is obviously not ourselves any more than an idea of a tree is a tree, any more than you can get wet in the word water. And to go on with, our image of ourselves is extremely inaccurate and incomplete. Would that some God, the gifted gears, to see ourselves as others see us. We don't. So my image of me is not at all your image of me. And my image of me is extremely incomplete in that it does not include any information to speak of about the functioning of my nervous system, my circulation, my metabolism, my subtle relationships with the entire surrounding human and non-human universe. 
So the image I have of myself as a caricature, it is arrived at through mainly my interaction with other people who tell me who I am in various ways, either directly or indirectly, and I play about with what their picture is of me, and they play something back to me so that we set up this conception. And this started very, very early in life. And I was told, you see, and you were told, that we must have a consistent image. You must be you. You have to find your identity in terms of image. And this is an awful red herring. A lot of the current quest for identity among younger people is a search for an acceptable image. What role can I play? Who am I in the sense of what am I going to do in life? And so on. Now, while that has a certain importance, if it's not backed up by deeper matters, it's extraordinarily misleading. So therefore, on the one hand, there is this image, which is intellectual, emotional, imaginative, and so forth. Now, we would say, I don't feel that I am only an image. I feel there's something more real than that, because I feel, I mean, I have a sense of there being a particular sort of, how do we say, a center of something, some sort of sensitive core inside the skin. And that corresponds to the word I. Let's take a look at this. Because the thing that we feel as being myself is certainly not the whole body. Because a lot of the body can be seen as an object. In other words, if you stand, stretch yourself out, lie on the floor and turn your head and look at yourself, you know, you can see your feet and your legs and all this up to here. And finally, it all vanishes, only there's a sort of a vague nose in front. And you assume you have a head because everybody else does. And you've looked in a mirror and that told you you had a head, but you could never see it just like you can't see your back. So you tend to put your ego on the side of the unseen part of the body, the part you can't get at, because that seems to be where it all comes from and you feel it. But what is it that we feel? Because if I see clearly and my eyes are in functioning order, the eyes certainly are not conscious of themselves. There are no spots in front of them, no defects, in other words, in the lens or in the retina or in the optic nerves that give hallucinations. So also, therefore, if my ego, my consciousness is working properly, I ought not to be aware of it as something sort of there, being a nuisance in a way in the middle of things because your ego is awfully hard to take care of. <laughs> well, what is it then that we feel? Well, I think I've discovered what it is. It's a chronic, habitual sense of muscular strain, which we were taught in the whole process of doing spontaneous things to order. When you're taking off in a jet plane, and the thing has gone rather further down the runway than you think it should have without getting up in the air, you start pulling at your seatbelt get this thing off the ground. Perfectly useless. So in the same way, when our community tells us, look carefully, now listen, pay attention, we start using muscular strains around our eyes, ears, jaws, hands, to try to use our muscles to make our nerves work which is, of course, futile. And in fact, it gets in the way of the functioning of the nerves. Try to concentrate. And then when we try to control our emotions, 
we hold our breath, pull our stomachs in, or tighten our rectal muscles to hold ourselves together. Now, pull yourself together. And immediately, what are you to do? What does a child understand by that? He does it muscularly, pulls himself together. This is useless. So everybody chronically pulls themselves together so that it's so funny, if you get a person to just lie on the floor and relax, but there's the floor under you as firm as can be holding you up. Nevertheless, you will detect that the person is making all sorts of tensions lest he should suddenly turn into a nasty jello on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so that chronic tension, which in Sanskrit is called sankocha, which means contraction, is the root of what we call the feeling of the ego. So that in other words, this feeling of tightness is the physical referent for the psychological image of ourselves. So that we get the ego as the marriage of an illusion to a futility. Even though the idea of an I with a name, with a being, is naturally useful for social communication, provided we know what we're doing and take it for what it is. But we are so hung up on this concept that it confuses us even in the proposition that it might be possible for us to feel otherwise. Because we ask the question, if we hear about people who have uh, transcended the ego, well, we ask, how do you do that? Well, I say, what do you mean? You, how do you do that? Because the you you're talking about doesn't exist. So you can't do anything about it. Any more than you can cut a cheese with a line of longitude. <laughs> now that sounds very discouraging, doesn't it? But let's suppose now you are babies again. And you don't know anything. Now, don't be frightened, because anything you know, you can get back later. But for the time being, here is our awareness. And let's suppose you have no information about this at all and no words for it. And that my talking to you is just a noise. Now, don't try to do anything about this. Don't make any effort. Because naturally, by force of habit, certain tensions remain inside you, and certain ideas and words drift all the time through your mind. Just like um, the wind blows or clouds move across the sky. Don't bother with them at all. Don't try to get rid of them. Just be aware of what's going on in your head like it was clouds in the sky or the crackling of the fire. There's no problem to this. All you have to do, really, is look and listen without naming, and if you are naming, never mind. Just listen to that. Now, that you can't force anything here, that you can't willfully stop thinking and stop naming, is only telling you that the separate you doesn't exist. It isn't a mark of defeat. It isn't a sign of your lack of practice in meditation. That it runs on all by itself simply means that the individual separate you is a figment of your imagination. So you are aware at this point 
of a happening. Remember, you don't know anything about the difference between you and it. You haven't been told that. You've no words for the difference between inside and outside, between here and there, and nobody has taught you that what you see out in front of you is either near or far from your eyes. Watch a baby put out a finger to touch the moon. You don't know about that. You just, therefore, here it is. We'll just call it this. And if you will feel it, the going on, which includes absolutely everything you feel. Well, whatever that is, it's what the Chinese call Tao, what Buddhists call suchness or Tathata. And it's a happening. It doesn't happen to you, because where is that? You, what you call you, is part of the happening, <laughs> or an aspect of it. It has no parts. It's not like a machine. And it's a little scary, because you'd say, well, who's in control around here? Why should there be anyone? Now that's an, a very weird notion we have that processes require something outside them to control them. It never occurred to us that processes could be self-controlling. Even though we say to someone, control yourself. We can always, <laughs> in order to think about self-control, we split a person in two. So that there's a you separate from the self that's supposed to be controlled. Well, how can that achieve anything? How can a noun start a verb? Yet it's a fundamental superstition that that can be done. So you have this process, which is quite spontaneous, going on. We call it life. It's controlling itself. It's aware of itself. It's aware of itself through you. You are an aperture through which the universe looks at itself. And because of it, so the universe looking at itself through you, there's always an aspect of itself that it can't see. So it is like that snake, you see, that is pursuing its tail. Because the snake can't see its head, like you can't. We always find, as we investigate the universe, make the microscope bigger and bigger, and we will find ever more minute things. Make the telescope bigger and bigger and bigger, and the universe expands because it's running away from itself. It won't do that if you don't chase it. <laughs> so, it's a game of hide-and-seek. Really, when you ask the question, who is doing the chasing, you are still working under the assumption that every verb has to have a subject. That when there is an action, there has to be a doer. Well, that's a, what I will call a grammatical convention leading to what Whitehead called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Like the famous it in It Is Raining. So when you say, 
there cannot be knowing without a knower. This is merely saying no more than there can't be a verb without a subject. And that's a grammatical rule and not a law of nature. Anything you can think of as a thing, as a noun, can be described by a verb. And there are languages which do that. It sounds awkward in English, but face it, when you look for doers as distinct from deeds, you can't find them. Just as when you look for stuff underlying the patterns of nature, you can't find any stuff, you just find more and more patterns. There never was any stuff. It's a ghost. What we call stuff is simply patterns seen out of focus. And it's fuzzy. So we call it stuff. <laughs> it's, you know, like a K-pop. <laughs> so, we, you know, we have these words, energy, matter, being, reality, even Tao. And we can never find them. They always elude us entirely. Although we do have the very strong intuition that all this that we see is connected or related. So we speak of a universe. Although that word really means one turn. It's your turn now. <laughs> or like you make one turn to look at yourself. But you can't make two turns and see what's looking. <laughs> So, it's very simple, therefore. You only have to understand that you can't do anything about it. And as they say in Zen, you cannot take hold of it, but you can't get rid of it. And in not being able to get it, you get it. So, all these trials that gurus put their students through have as their ultimate object convincing you that you can't do anything. Only it's convincing you very thoroughly. It's convincing you in more than a theoretical way. Now perhaps I shouldn't tell you that. But you see, I'm not a guru in that I don't give individual spiritual direction to people. And I give away the guru's tricks. That may not be very good, but on the other hand, those tricks are only necessary in the sense that I would say to someone, it's necessary for you to go to a psychiatrist if you think you must. And if you are not going to be satisfied without going to Japan and studying Zen Buddhism from a Roshi, okay, you better go. It isn't necessary unless you say it is if that's the only thing that will satisfy you and you feel that deep down inside you. If you've got that yen, therefore you've got that yen. But if on the other hand you haven't, you haven't. And I'm not going to put you down on that account, you see. The point is, what do you want to do? What is it in you to do? But there it is, that you can struggle and struggle and struggle, and indeed will do so, as long as you have the feeling inside you that you're missing something. And people, your friends, all sorts of people will do their utmost to persuade you that you're missing something. <laughs> because they're missing something and they think they're getting it through a certain way. And therefore, to assure themselves, they'd like you to do it too. So there's this thing. And you see, a clever guru beguiles his students by letting them have the feeling of success and accomplishment in certain directions. A guru gives people exercises, A, that are difficult but can be accomplished, and B, that are impossible. 
you'll always be hung up on the impossible ones, but the possible ones, you will feel, get a feeling of making progress so that you will double your efforts to solve the impossible exercises. And then they range things in many, many ranks and levels through which you can advance this state of consciousness, that state of consciousness, or think of the degrees of masonry, or so on. Ranks in learning things, the different belts you get in judo and all that kind of jazz. You can do that. And it gives people the sense of competing with themselves or even with others. Because of the feeling inside that there is just something I'm missing. And of course, if you are learning any sort of skill and you haven't perfected the skill, there is indeed something you're missing. But in this thing that we're talking about, that isn't true. Because you, as the Buddhists say, are Buddhas from the very beginning. And all that searching is like looking for your own head, which you can't see and therefore might conceivably imagine that you're lost. So, that indeed is the point, that we don't see what looks, and therefore we think we've lost it. And so we're in search of the self, the Atman. Well, that's the one thing we can't find, <laughs> because we have it. We are it. <laughs> but we confuse it with all these images. So therefore, if you understand perfectly clearly that you can't do anything to find that very, very important thing, God, enlightenment, nirvana, whatever, then what? Well, I find, you know, it's so stupid because even if I tell myself, well, there's nothing I can do about it. Why did I say that? You see, why did I say that? Why did I go out of my way to tell myself there's nothing I can do about it? Because in the back of my mind, there was a funny little feeling that if I did tell myself that, something different would happen. See? All right. So even that doesn't work. Nothing works. Now, when absolutely nothing works, where are you? Well, here we are. I mean, you, there's this feeling of something going on. Now, the world doesn't stop dead when there's nothing you can do. Here's something happening. Now, just there, that's what I'm talking about. There's the happening. When you are not doing anything about it, you're not not doing anything about it, you just can't help it. It goes on despite anything you think or worry about or whatever. Now... There is the point, right there. And remember, although you will think at first that this is a kind of determinism, there are two reasons why it isn't. One, there is nobody being determined. Now, other people think of determinism as the direction of what happens by the past, the causation of what happens by the past. Now, if you will use your senses, you will see that that is a hallucination. The present does not come from the past. If you listen, and only listen, close your eyes, where do the sounds come from, according to your ears? You hear them coming out of silence. The sounds come and then they fade off. They go like echoes, or echoes in the labyrinths of your brain, which we call memories. The sounds don't come from the past. They come out of now and trail off. You can do that later with your eyes. You can see, like when you're watching television, 
there's a vibration coming out from the screen to your eyes. And it starts from there somehow. Because we see the hands and then they move, we think that the movement is caused by the hands and that the hands were there before and so can move later. We don't see that our memory of the hands is an echo of their always being now. They never were, they never will be, they're always now. So is the motion. And that, that is recollected is the trailing off echo like the wake of a ship. And so just as the wake doesn't move the ship, the past does not move the present, unless you insist that it does. And if you say, well, naturally, I'm always moved by the past, that's an alibi. <laughs> and it completely fails to explain how you ever learn anything new. <laughs> that's why all the psychologists who are mostly behaviorists are completely bogged down in trying to find a theory of learning. Because according to the, the theory of learning that we have, everything that new that you assimilate is really only learned when translated into terms of what you already know. So in that sense, learning becomes like a library which increases only by the addition of books about books already in it. <laughs> and a lot of libraries are indeed like that. So, that's what we call scholasticism. So then, you become aware that this happening isn't happening to you because you are the happening. The only you there is, is what's going on. Yeah, feel it. And disregard these stupid distinctions that you've been taught. I mean, stupid, relatively speaking and feel it genuinely. When you feel it genuinely, you get down to rock bottom, all that isn't there. That's a game that's been erected on it. And it isn't determined. In other words, you get this odd feeling of a synthesis between doing and happening, in which doing is as much happening as happening, and happening is as much doing as doing. And if you are not very careful at that point, you'll proclaim yourself God Almighty in the Hebrew Christian sense. <laughs> like Freud alleges babies feel that they're omnipotent. And in a way they are. I am omnipotent insofar as I'm the universe but I'm not I'm omnipotent in the role of Alan Watts. Only cunning. <laughs> so now then, this sensation of the happening is basic to all we want to explore. With that in mind, we can go on now to the question of pain and our so-called reactions to it. And once again, you will see that the problem as posed immediately sets up the duality of the pain and the one who suffers it, <laughs> the one who offers resistance. And therefore, reasoning from that, you can quite easily see that a great deal of the energy of pain is derived from the resistance offered to it. And that resistance takes very many forms, not only of attempts to get away from a pain which is present, let's suppose you try to run away from a migraine headache. As you carry it with you, 
you can't get away from it, and it seems to be absolutely in the middle of everything that you are. So that however much you thresh and resist, the pain goes with the threshing. Other forms of pain are problematic to a large extent because of our prior anxiety about them and because of the valuations that we put on them. And we may as well start from that point. And what we very largely dislike about people in pain is the noise they make. When I challenged R.H. Blythe and said, you're a vegetarian, but don't you realize that plants have feelings? He said, yes, I do, but they don't scream so loudly. And so, uh, you say, in a hospital or any place like that, it is taboo to scream because you must understand that hospitals and any institution of that kind is run for the convenience of the staff. <laughs> All institutions are. <laughs> and so, everything is done in such a way as to interiorize, localize pain. Of course, in a way that makes it worse. So we have a big, big social problem, fundamental, right from the beginning, about our reaction to anything painful. And these are very odd things. Let's take, for example, when a child has eaten something that doesn't agree with it and it vomits. Now, you well know that when you've got a bad stomach, that vomiting is a very pleasant release from that. But because when mama sees the vomit, or somebody else does, they say, ugh, you are taught that doing it is socially unacceptable, and therefore people suppress vomiting and learn from their parents that it's nasty, just as they learn that excrement is nasty, and just as they learn to worry about disease and death. Now, there really isn't anything radically wrong with being sick or with dying.